Well, good morning. Uh, beautiful Saturday morning here in California, and 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 uh, and Dr. Q in you're in Florida, right? Yes. So welcome, and we're gonna get you started in just a second. We're gonna show a quick video, and then from there, um, we'll get the program started. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. We are Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online community for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those that do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. PST, and on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. PST. If you aren't able to attend the event, all our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end with Q&A with our speakers. Any questions that you have can be put in the Q&A section on Zoom and our team members will read them and have them answered. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you'll be awarded a two-hour mentorship certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with our upcoming events or want to tell your pre-med friends about pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at pre-med CC. Dr. Q came to the United States at 19 as an undocumented person unable to speak English. He started working as a farmhand in Central Valley, California and saved enough money to take English classes at San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton, California. He continued his studies at the University of California at Berkeley and graduated with the highest honors. He received his medical degree from Harvard University where he graduated cum laude. He completed his residency in neurosurgery at the University of California, San Francisco, where he also completed a postdoctoral fellowship in developmental and stem cell biology. His career began at the John Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He became a professor of neurosurgery and oncology, neurology, and cellular and molecular medicine, and director of the Brain Tumor Stem Cell Laboratory. Today, he is the William J. and Charles H. Mayo Professor and Chair of Neurologic Surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Dr. Hugh is the Principal Investigator at the Brain Tumors Stem Cell Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic and the founder and president of the nonprofit organization, Mission Brain. Dr. Q's story was featured on the BBC and Netflix show, The Surgeon's Cut, in December 2020, and more recently, Anna Purna Pictures and Plan B Entertainment Productions announced that his inspirational life story is going to be featured in a movie. We are really happy to have you here, Dr. Q. We'll turn it over to you. And I actually mm -hmm. want to in introduce another important person, uh, Certainly in Dr. Q's life, but many people's life is Mr. Uh, Hugo Mora Torres, who's the pre-health advisor at UC Berkeley. He has uh, worked around a lot of uh, schools from Santa Cruz to San Jose State. And now he's at Berkeley and he's actually someone who mentored Dr. Q when he was a pre-med student, just like many of you. And so uh, if you're lucky enough to be at Berkeley, you could go see uh, Hugo, but um, but he we're glad that he was able to make it today as well. Who, uh, if you know some of you that were in our book club, uh, Hugo was actually in the book and story. So this is mm. so we're glad that he was able to come today. Well, thank you, Mindy, and thank you, Jubin, and Hugo. Thank you. I was just thinking, I was. Thinking back on the fall of 1994, when I was just a first-year medical student and you came to visit me, and I took you to see this extraordinary movie <laughs> that I was really super excited, and the title of the movie was Squanto, 
A Warrior's Tale. That was probably one of the worst movies that we have ever seen in our lives. And Hugo kept teasing me for decades to come, you know, after finishing medical school. But thank you. It's so great to see you. And I just, just seeing you here on the screen, it just refreshed my memory about that, that, you know, that fall in 1994. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And just, I will tell you stories and a journey you know, that involves Hugo and I will relate it back. And I'm just so glad to see him here because I am connected to him in more ways than one, not only through user Berkeley, but through my life. There are some people that play an important role in one's lives and he's definitely been one of them. And we're connected in more, more ways than one. And I'll tell the story a little bit about that. And you may or may not know that his sister you know, there's a house named after his sister there in uh, UC Berkeley, and she actually had brain cancer, you know, and uh, and it's interesting. That's what I specialize nowadays. Sometimes I, I, you know, over the course of the many years in my life, I thought that things happened to me by chance. But as I got an older, I began to realize that the, there are spiritual connections. There are energy connections that puts us together and puts us in a path that sometimes we don't understand. So I hope that keeping that in mind, I'll take you through this journey and, and this path, and maybe I'll get to share some stories, and maybe you get to learn something. I don't know. To be thoughtful, do I have about 30 minutes, more or less? You know, because I want to be respectful of people's times and stuff like that. So, I, you know, that's more or less what I time. And I don't know if there's going to be a, question, a, a time for questions or not at the end, but if one of you guys can take them from the chat or something that, that and, and filter them, and I'll be delighted to answer anything. So let me go ahead and share this. I have my presentation right here and you'll see the title that I gave it. So a uh, thumbs up, Hugo, did you see it? Yes, excellent, thumbs up. So this is something that I thought about it. I, I, you know, I grew up in a small little town in Mexicali, which is the border right there in California between uh, Mexico and the United States. And I went there to be where I am today, the Mayo Clinic, which is arguably one of the most, if not the most respected healthcare system in the uh, in the globe. It is an amazing place for patient care. I've been blessed that to be, you know, uh, given several uh, lectures, uh, several titles, as you can see. I always think, you know, that the more titles you have, the more responsibilities you have. That's, that's really what it means, you know, and uh, all these titles mean nothing without help. All these titles mean nothing without acknowledging the many unsung heroes behind each of us that allow us to do what we do every single day. So I went there and I came to the United States, as uh, it was mentioned already, you know, as an un undocumented migrant farm worker. And I've been blessed to go from there, you know, what I call from harvest to harvest. And I'll tell you a little bit of that story as well. And hopefully in between I tell you this story, you know, I'll get to... Um, reflect upon and I always like to tell the stories because it also they teach me more stuff and they allow me to think differently sometimes about the, my own things that I'm doing so I put this slide because I think it's important you know we all surround ourselves by people who are much brighter and especially those who are successful surround themselves by many 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 people who are much brighter and they're not afraid to recognize in my case I've been surrounded by people who have amazing, you know, talents. I mean, I can tell you right now, I just finished giving a talk at one of our Congress talking about chimeric antigen receptor therapy that we do in our laboratory and how we are curing cancer and rodents. And now we're moving to spontaneous dog models, how we put some patents and started some companies related to this work, you know, and I had a bunch of people there in the from my laboratory and they all left me they went for lunch to a place called añejo for mexican food the only person that stayed with me is this young man right here look adrian right there <laughs> so he is the one who's helping making sure that all the connections were fine that i had a room here in the resort to be able to speak with you and stuff like that adrian is a more recent team member that came this is only the tip of the iceberg this is the, what i call the inner inner circle of my laboratory because my laboratory is uh, is about 35 people right now and I oversee the department of neurosurgery which is about 275 people and then now as a dean of research I oversee another maybe 1500 people 
you know, all together that they, I, I respond to all of them. That's really what it comes out. They don't respond to me. I respond to them. But this is the inner, inner circle. These are the people who day in and day out uh, allow me to do my research, allow me to dream of a better world, allow me to go around as a leader and go around in meetings, go around through my foundation and, and start new companies and, and do intellectual property, new discoveries. And they keep me young, to be honest with you. They keep me dreaming. They keep me excited. They keep me engaged because I have to learn so much from every single one of them. And I think that that's maybe one of the pearls that I you know, I share with all of you and you'll see th throughout my trajectory when I was in community college, when I was to use, went to UC Berkeley and I met uh, Ugo, I think that I have been so blessed to be, to surround myself by people who are much, much brighter. This is me. I grew up in that small little town and that's me. That's a picture of me. Look at this right here. My head back then was almost as big as my shoulders. All right. So one of my colleagues, you know, who's a very famous brain surgeon who actually ran for president, Ben Carson, you know, said once, oh, Alfredo, if I seen you when you were little, I probably would have put it, would have uh, placed a shunt. It's a shunt is when you manage water from the brain down to your belly because the brain is so big, it's full of water, you know, but uh, likely I was not in the hands of a surgeon, so I kept just growing with a big head. But that little boy had dreams, that little boy had aspirations. And I look at myself in the mirror nowadays and I have to admit it, you know, I just uh, sometimes I don't recognize myself because my spirit, my energy, my enthusiasm, my zest for life hasn't changed. It's the same as it was when I was that little boy growing up in Mexico. But yes, I had amazing role models. You know, my mom and dad were, you know, my first role models. They were hardworking people. This is the gas station in the outsides in the middle of nowhere, maybe about 60 kilometers down from the border in which I started working when I was five years old. And I started working in this little gas station and I have fun memories. Behind this little gas station, I made my first scientific experiment. I knew that uh, that gasoline was flammable. So my little brother Gabriel was three years old and I was about five. And I got a gallon of gasoline, went behind a mountain, a, a, a bunker. And then on the other side of the bunker, I ignited that gas and I saw the little trail of gasoline and an explosion. And I was hooked. I ran back to the gas station to get another gallon of gasoline. Of course, my father caught me. And, you know, my dad was only 20 years old when he had me. And I can see a little smile in his face, but he had to act very tough because he knew how dangerous that was. But, you know, somewhere along the line, these mentors, you know, mom and dad, they cultivated that spirit of in inquisitive mind, you know. And that throughout my life, he kept doing science until the point that I did an experiment in which I had seen many of my relatives come to the United States as braceros. These are the people who come and do migrant farm work. And I had this dream that I was going to come to the United States at age 19, and I was going to make enough money to go back to Mexico and uh, and go to school because I wanted to become, to go to university. I didn't know yet that I wanted to be a doctor. I knew my grandmother, my Nana Maria was a curandera, a partera, that was a town killer and a midwife in a small little town way outside of the uh, of the city of Mexicali. Mexicali was considered a large city at the time. There were about 300,000 people, but we would live way outside, you know, way out in the uh, in the middle of the farming communities. And she was so highly respected. And I had a dream maybe that one day I could achieve the level of respect that she had accumulated in the community, that gravitas, that veritas that you only get when you're good to people, when you give people things that they don't have, when you give yourself with passion and dedication. So I had that dream and I have that fence. That is exactly the place between Calexico and Mexicali. The other side is Mexicali. This side, I'm taking the pictures from the American side. I took this picture. This is the picture that I took after I met Hugo. And Hugo had encouraged me to begin to document my own journey. This is 1994, right before I am about to go to medical school at Harvard. So that was the seeking of a better life. You know, me thinking, you know, I am going to achieve a better life. So one night in January 2nd, 1987, I hopped that fence, made it to the United States. I got caught by the Immigration Naturalization Service. Immediately, I bit the dust right at the corner of that street. And my, you know, my luck determined that I wasn't destined to stop there. 
the same night I tried it again. The second time I was successful and I ended up a few nights later in the San Joaquin Valley working on the field. But that space right there, I look back and you'll see some pictures that I have more recently. That's where I almost, you know, fell and uh, injured myself the second time. I bought my first house. This is 1987. This is a trailer that I bought in the San Joaquin Valley. This is a beautiful valley of agriculture. I look back at my time as a farm worker, and there were some beautiful times. There were some sad times also. There was sadness that, uh, you know, uh, every now and then would get to me thinking about how uncertain my future was. I was there living alone. No one in my family had gone to school. I was thinking that I was going to make enough money to go back to Mexico. But at $3.35 an hour, you know, working day in and day out with my hands full of, you know, blood and, uh, and, and little to eat, I knew that that, uh, that dream was going to be challenging. And every day, it kept getting more and more difficult. By 1988, you know, I went from the San jo to the San Joaquin Delta College. I moved to Stockton, California one night when I was told by my own relatives that my destiny was there to work for the rest of my life in the fields. And I just believe that there's got to be something else. I moved to Stockton, California. I began my school, my studies at night to learn English. I couldn't, I didn't know English. I'd never went to school. I'd never, you know, uh, learning English in Mexico at the time was considered for the elite, was considered for people who were rich. And I, we were not, we had barely enough to eat. By the time I left Mexico in 1987, we, the economic uh, devaluation, a bifurcation of classes had taken over the country. We were more poor than before. And I was looking for a better life to send money back to my parents. I become an, as, as a welder. And I got to tell you, Nowadays, I look back, another beautiful part of my life, being a welder was another extraordinarily important lesson in my life, how to work in teams, how to care for people in dangerous situations. I almost lost my life in April 14, 1989, you know, before I got accepted into Berkeley in 1991. And just between Delta College and, and uh, UC Berkeley in uh, 1989, I saw myself and a fork in my life. And that's when I decided that I wanted to do something with my life when I almost lost my own life working in the railroad and which I saw myself trapped in a liquefied petroleum tanker and I was taken out of that tanker almost dead. I wrote that essay for medical school with the help of Ugo directly. And I never forget, you know, this is where your mentors become such amazing people in your life. By 1994, you know, in a few trials and tribulations, my family was together. Again, my siblings were in the United States. We were all in different cities, and I decided to go on and apply to medical school, and that's when I left California. I was blessed that I got accepted into medical school, of course. At the time, and that's something that I learned from Ugo, I remember thinking, you know, many of my classmates were fixed in where they wanted to go to medical school. And I remember talking to Ugo and learning from him that it was not the destination that mattered, but it was the journey where you learn. So to me, going to medical school was nothing else but the journey. And as long as I got into a medical school, no matter what, I was going to give it my best. I was going to get good grades. I was going to enjoy my journey. And I ended up getting into the top medical school, Stanford, UCSF, Hopkins, Harvard, all these places that eventually, you know, allow me to begin to dream of a better world. And I remember one day, so at the time that I interviewed for medical school, I had long hair. And I remember one night, Hugo got me together you know, with his friends and they encouraged me to go ahead and cut my hair because I was going into a different discipline, a different part of the world. And and they encouraged me to take and accept, you know, the challenge of going into uh, medical school at Harvard, not really knowing the, that from coast to coast, I took my first flight from San Francisco to Boston and began my medical school. From medical school, of course, I continue my life. I went back, graduated in 1999, went to UC San Francisco. I finished my residence with honors. I went on and started my first laboratory. This is my team in 2007. I began my residency in 99, finished in 2005, began my faculty position in 2005 at Johns Hopkins as an assistant professor. At this point, I'm an associate professor, and there's so many amazing people in that picture who are now 
so associate professors, full professors, you know, faculty member in different parts of the world. And it is amazing. Once again, you surround yourself by people who are brilliant and don't be afraid of recognizing that your talents may not be as good as theirs, but be cognizant of what your talents are and how they may complement other people. And that is one of the challenges that we have in order to be successful leaders, successful physicians, successful surgeons. I wrote my journey, you know, becoming Dr. Q first in English through UC Press, then it was translated to Spanish. And just last year, the book was re-released by Mayo Press. If you have an opportunity, get the book, go to the library, get the book, read it. Because it's not a story about me. It's a universal story of those who want to change the world, of those who come to this country with the idea that through determination, resilience, excitement, admiration, mentorship, and strength, you can achieve your dreams. And that goes to anybody. And that's why I think it's, this book has been successful, because it's a universal principle of many, many people who have a dream of a better life. And of course, in between, you learn about my Nana Maria, about my Tata Juan, about Hugo, about Dr. Martinez, about so many mentors and so many amazing people. And of course, the later chapters, life and death situation with me as a brain surgeon, which as you can imagine, as a brain surgeon, I deal with the most challenging diseases in the brain, brain tumors, the skull brain tumors, cancer is still the most devastating disease. So I talk about that and I talk about the impact uh, that he has had in my life. I have two more books coming out over the next couple of years. It's a sequel, a, a follow-up to Becoming Dr. Q. One is about stories, seven patient stories that have changed my life and the life of many people. And another one is about the leadership. Inside of us, there is a leader and we do it. We do it inside of the operating room. I was a leader when I was in the field. And sometimes it's recognizing that leadership that becomes important. Just why are we have such a capacity? It's simple. Our brains are immense. They are amazing. Inside each of your brains right now, there's a hundred billion neurons and four to 800 trillion synapses going on, forming connections. They're listening to me, trying to figure out what I'm saying. And I can assure you, you have more synapses in your brain than there are stars in our galaxy. Just think about this. We have more synapses going on than stars in our Milky Way. It is unbelievable. These brains are so powerful and so beautiful and so extraordinarily, you know, uh, uh, unexplored that my journey is full of richness every single day that I go to work. And this is where I work. You know, I go from Mexicali to the Mayo Clinic. This is the Mayo Clinic in Florida, which in my opinion is the most beautiful. You can see the water right there and beyond the water. That's the marge. Beyond the water is the sea. So we're literally only less than half a mile away from the beach. You know, we're like, you know, quarter of a mile away from the marge. You know, this is where my office is located in the Mangurian building. This is where my laboratory is located at the Griffin building. Extraordinary talent. This is where I live. And this is where the beach is. You know, you can actually see it's a, And the campus is growing vigorously. We have our own medical school now. And I am just so blessed, of course, to be able to carry the history of the Mayo brothers. Just think about this 158 years of history through the title that I carry. And never in a million years did I imagine that a small boy that came from Mexicali was going to make it to the Mayo Clinic to where it is right now. But I am. I am here. And I studied brain cancer. Why do I study brain cancer? Because it's simply the most devastating disease that affects the humanity, in my opinion. It affects the human brains in ways that I never really thought of when I was at your state, when I was in community college. But over the years, I began to be able to articulate my fears, my desires, and also to be able to advocate for patients with brain cancer. This is a paper that I published with uh, Kareem, who was a postdoc in my lab, in which we have demonstrated that over the years, we have a steady, remain steady in cardiovascular diseases, cerebral vascular diseases, but cancer continues to rise. And one of those cancers is brain cancer. You can see, this is actually a paper that we just published, made the cover last year in 2003. 
And that's an experiment that I dreamed of the first time back in 2003 when I was arrested in IUCSF and I was a postdoctoral fellow. I had a dream that I was going to be able to tag and mark brain cancer cells from humans and be able to put them in human tissue. It's called an organotypic map. And I was able to finally, after trials and tribulations, many, many failures, you know, do the first experiment, and this is an image that you're seeing with multi-photon microscopy cancer cells tagged with gr green fluorescent protein in the human brain. We did that experiment in 2015, and finally, we published a paper in 2023. Just think about this, all righty? Uh, 20 years later, after thinking of an experiment, I was able to publish that paper. You know, and that's why, because I was able to be able to capitalize in the ability of being able to do the right surgery for the right patients. You know, one of the things that I learned through my years and of, of being a brain surgeon, a resident, a medical student, and a student all the way back to community college is that lives matter. Our patients have diseases that sometimes are so complex and the therapies that we also present to them, they can be quite complex and scary. My role is to simplify. My role is to tell them what I'm going to do, to tell them a story, get them through the surgery, even though I am about to take, for instance, in this patient, a such a large tumor. And I am about to take you into the operating room. So for those who may be a little queasy about surgery, close your eyes or just listen to me. And those who want to see, they're about to see a brain surgery. So here I am in the operating room. You may actually hear the patient playing music, doing the stuff. Let's see if we can actually, I can take you through this right here. This is going to be the actual surgery that the location, this is surgeon, surgery that is on the right side. We're going to do the patient awake. We are doing the opening of the scalp. We are going to go ahead and open the, the actual bone and we use the drill. And I remember the first time my son saw me using the drill, he said, daddy, you're almost like mommy. Mommy does everything around the house. Mom is an amazing engineer you know, by, 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 by birth, basically. She was a high school teacher, science teacher, but she's an amazing engineer. And my son had never seen me using a drill. So here I am, we're taking the, the actual bone off and we're gonna get, at, at this point, the patient is uh, being tested, you know, for language mapping. And there's done all kinds of studies. We're stimulating, we are looking at areas of the brain that makes uh, a function or no function. I publish extensively at this. I have books on this. I have uh, in the actual show that uh, that it was mentioned, actually, you know, by Mindy, there's, uh, there's a, a scene right there, you know, where I am doing a wake brain surgery. And uh, it was captured beautifully in that documentary. Lucy Blackstar, who was a director you know, ended up winning an, an Emmy Award and then a BAFTA with that documentary. Really amazing. So here we are, disconnecting the tumor, right? But think about this. Oh, the patient is playing the guitar right now. The patient, the patient had a whole concert dedicated to me at this point, and it was amazing to feel that. I imagine me doing surgery and the patient has a whole concerto of the Spanish, Mexican, Cuban music you know, for me during this time. And it was unbelievable to see this. And here we are taking the tumor. The tumor is gigantic. It was bigger than my fist, of course, you know, and all this tumor, you know, he keeps going through the testing, playing the guitar, and we're doing all the testing necessary, you know, to make sure that the patient is going to have good function right here. But you can see, look at this amazing, and I am going to have to take it. It's connected in two places. It's super large. It is being uh, quite elaborate, you know, and at the end of the procedure, of course, we, ca we got it all out. We closed the skin. We closed the bone. We took the patient back to the, um, to the actual uh, post-anesthesia care unit, and we were able to study the disease. What do we do with this tissue? You know, I thought about it even when I was a resident to take the tissue back to the laboratory to build the bridge between the operating room and the laboratory. And that's probably the greatest contribution in addition to my children, my trainees, of course, my greatest contribution to science because I have figured out how to ask questions that are physically relevant, that are scientifically relevant, and they can be done using tissue or asking them directly in the operating room. In my case, 
I began to put patents, inventions all the way from mesenchymal stem cells using fat to fight brain cancer. I partnered with engineers that had no idea of the medical questions, but they knew the engineering. So we partnered, we engineered mesenchymal stem cells with nano, nano, uh, nanoparticles. We began to study how cells move in the brain, the go and the grow of cancer. We began to really unravel the mechanisms. I even formed a company a few years ago where we studied the go and the grow of cancer. We're fighting this disease with mesenchymal stem cells. I continue. We, we then say, oh my gosh, I'm not happy with how cells are moving in the brain. I'm not happy how cells are moving moving in the surface, we were just putting them in nano patterns, actually in, uh, in, in nano pattern devices that we patented. I said, we have to put them in pathways and corridors where they are in circle. And that's when we came up with an idea of putting them in microfluidic nanotubes to see the migration. And you can actually see right here, look at these amazing cells moving, you know, like an army and they can squeeze through the most narrow, look at the far right. This is why we cannot defeat this disease. So look at this, a migrant farm worker who cannot speak English, who went to community college, went to Berkeley, Harvard, UCSF, Hopkins, now Mayo is doing this experiment. I'm not an engineer. I'm not brighter than any of you, but I had a dream and I was not willing to give up on that dream. We began to use this mesenchymal stem cells fat to fight brain cancer as Trojan horses. We use the operating room as an extension of the laboratory. We have operated on patients myself of over 41 countries. I collect their tissue. I am a person that I see myself more than a scientist or a surgeon or a mentor or a professor. I see myself as someone who has the ability to give patients and families hope. Just think about it, as simple as that. And I try to do it through my work. I try to do it through my mentees, through the things that I do, the things that are right, through my science, and most recently also through the foundation. You know, we have collaborations with places from all over the world, or at leading grants that are, you know, multi-million dollar grants. And, and my lab has been the recipient of federal grants for many, many years. And I've been blessed by every single person that has allowed me to learn from them. And I think that is a philosophy that I teach you as a pearl number two. Be willing and be open. Don't be afraid of learning from others. Never feel jealousy. Don't waste time on jealousy. Jealousy is just, it is not going to take you anywhere. Be happy for others. Extend your hand, open your arms, open your heart, open your brain and say, how can I learn from you? You know, every single person has something to teach you. And over the years, of course, I published, we have a whole wall in my laboratory. If one day, hopefully you have an opportunity to visit. We have a documentary coming up in some of the work that I do in science and mission brain. And there's a whole wall field of journals, articles. Many labs have spent so many years in trying to get a cover of a journal. We have gotten by now dozens and dozens of walls filled of those many books that have been translated in many languages around the world, read by many people around the world. These are my latest three books that I put together with someone who was my medical student. Kaisu Chaichana, think about these, uh, the two left books. He was my medical student. Now he gets to teach me. I get to learn. But guess what? He thinks he's now teaching me. It turns out he was teaching me all the way back when he was to when he was a medical student. He just didn't realize it, actually. But every single person has the ability to teach you something. We have translator or work into humans. Just think about this. Using mesenchymal stem cells in the brain at the time of surgery, and we have done it. Why? Because of the sheer determination and resilience and dreams that our team members have also to be able to change the world. And their knowledge, of course, and the fact that my patients need it. I am tired of seeing my patients succumb and surrender to the disease. They don't fail. And that's something that I learned over the They don't fail. Our therapies are failing them. And that's allowing me to be even more pointed in my, in my research that I do. This is the latest clinical trial. Very few scientists and clinician scientists around the world get to see their work going from the laboratory back to the patient. Now we are seeing it. And that's because I, once again, I put teams together and I ask them, this is my dream. And this is the work that we need to do. As a leader, you need to learn how to follow 
and how to step away from the people who are brighter, how to give them the resources, how to put stories. And that's probably, and of course, you have to understand the science. You have to be creative, innovative every now and then. My role is to come up with crazy ideas. And that's what I keep doing. You know, these are the patients that are involved in our preoperative stereotactic radio surgery. Now we even have, as I told you, I just gave a talk in chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy. I didn't know anything about CAR T's five years ago. I had to force myself to learn from my students, from my colleagues, from my patients, because they were asking me, if you don't keep learning, you just simply are going to get bored of what you're doing. And it is very, very important to never, never stop learning. I look back at that little immigrant who came to work in the fields, who was crazy. I thought I was going to start my trucking company. You know, that was my first company that I started. I look back. This was 1988. I lost my truck in the middle of Highway 99. And it was a blessing. I didn't understand it at the time. You know, but ashes, when you look at from the past, they can mean they may mean destruction, they may mean death. But when you look it forward, they actually serve as fertilizer and they may mean new life and new opportunities. And that's exactly what it was for me losing that first company opportunities. Since then, I have had many other companies that I opened. I continued to fail many times. Those are my first three companies that I opened with my colleagues from Harvard, Yale, and Hopkins. They failed, not because they were not good ideas, it's because the team wasn't right. Over the last few years, I learned that losing, missing is not the issue. It's how do you react, what you learn from it, you know? And I learned tremendously from that failure. And now, of course, we have put a tremendous amount of work in our grants. We continue to write grants to be able to support our laboratory work and research. And the only reason why I succeeded is because I was never afraid to learn from my own mistakes. I learned you know, if you have an opportunity, watch this documentary, not because of me, but this got a Peabody Award. It was released in 2009. It's a beautiful documentary of, of, of physicians, surgeons, nurses, you know, people at the front desk, the unsung heroes. If You know, and right around that time, as, 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 as it was mentioned by Mindy, you know, my son was teasing me because there was an announcement that there was going to be a movie made about me and your children have the opportunity to keep you humble. My son asked me, Daddy, who's going to play your role? I said, it's going to be someone tall, handsome, and muscular, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He started laughing. He says, Daddy, it's going to be Danny DeVito. And I met Danny DeVito at UC Berkeley. He's literally uh, much smaller than I am. You know, but my kids, you know, they, they tease me because my kids already are tall. My wife is about two inches taller than I am, you know, and I'm about five, seven with cowboy boots. I'm proud of that. But the, the reality is that they have an ability to keep you humble, you know. And then the latest one, I give really credit, Lucy and James. Lucy is a, an amazing director with James, also a director. If you have an opportunity, watch his documentary. One is about slavery in England. The other one is about people in space. And now he has his documentary about surgeons and me, this, the, the, this episode about a brain surgeon and they got nominated. They got awards, the BAFTA, which is equivalent of the Oscars, the Emmys. It was an amazing show, not just because of me. There are four surgeons being featured, but to me, it was about the patients. It's the patients that you get to see. The first one was about the surgeons and the physicians and the team. This one is about the patients and they are compliment and they're beautifully stories tell. You know, I talked about it. The brain was not meant to be open, you know, and I really meant, mean that our minds are meant to be open all the time. Our, our brains, this confined space, were meant, were meant to be closed. So I don't take it for granted. And I'm very grateful what I get to do every single day as a surgeon. I leave you with this last thought because this is my latest endeavor. This is a documentary that a company, Higher Ground, actually led by Ed, Edward James, almost out of Hollywood, they're putting together. This is the foundation that we started. We, I planted a seed. I started the foundation by myself in 2006, traveling after finishing residency. By 2011, partnered with April, Lisa, Will, and Michael, and we created a 501c3. We continue to grow during the pandemic, and especially after the release of the Netflix documentary. Now we have grown to over 26 countries. We have over 95 what I call neurons. They're called chapters because they're forming connections. Last year alone, 
we finished with over a thousand full-time members that are working on behalf of our foundation around the world to make the world a better place. You know, they're all over the place. These are the latest chapters that we form. We have uh, relationships with institutions, global institutions, institutions that are making a difference. But at the end of the day, it's people. People are the engines that ignite a change. They decided, you know, and I didn't decide, I planted the seed. They decided that we needed a revolution, not just an evolution. You know, I look, you know, last year alone, we had so many people and patients. We had over 67, almost 7,000 healthcare providers directly touch their educations through events, giving them hope that they're not forgotten. They are the unsigned heroes. We touched directly almost 2,200 patients. Think about this, 2,200 families around the globe directly touched by the care that we are providing. And the foundation started as a, and the neuroscience of space, and now it's gone t- everywhere. Students are, once again, created a revolution, not an evolution. I invite you, you don't have chapters in your community colleges and your places, form one. I challenge you to keep changing the world. The world is vast. The opportunities are enormous. Don't be afraid of challenging yourself. Challenge me as a leader of this organization, as the president and founder. And I challenge you. Just this morning, we had a town hall with hundreds of participants. I just, I told them, I said, I challenge you for the next chapter that we go to our communities, at least here in the United States, because the world is already doing. The chapters around the world are going into the impoverished uh, uh, areas and providing care and giving them hope. I said, I challenge you to go to our communities where people have never met a physician, where people have never met a student who understands science, technology, engineering, and math in touch. Let them know they also have the ability and the capacity to change the world. Surround yourself by people who are brighter. Don't be afraid. In my case, I think youth is amazing. They are the builder of images and dreams, and they never give up. And they allow me to stay young and keep going in my own endeavors. You know, I hope that you have an opportunity to visit, you know, our social media and our web page at missionbrain, you know, uh, org because it's an amazing organization. I challenge you to potentially be part of this. I am being challenged every single day. Please, when you have an opportunity, you know, come, that's my personal email as well. You know, I think that, you know, I don't have time to do a lot of stuff, but I always tell my students and the people around me, don't be afraid of pushing yourself. You know, find mentors. There's a fine line between mentors and tormentors. You know, Hugo never was a tormentor to me. He was always a mentor. I have to admit it, I am more of a tormentor to my mentees than he was to me. So I'm very grateful for that. So if you have an opportunity to follow us, you know, be part of this extraordinarily world that is changing and evolving. So I thank you immensely for allowing me to come in and say a few words, and I'd be delighted to spend a few minutes answering a few questions. Thank you. Thank you again for the inspiration, Dr. Q. Um, And I'll let Mindy start with the questions. All right. First question here. Um, In your book, Becoming Dr. Q, you mentioned several instances where peers made negative remarks that you faced while pursuing your undergrad degree at Berkeley or when you were in medical school at Harvard. Do you have any advice on how to approach dealing with those types of comments? Beautiful question. You know, I... uh... Over the years, I have evolved in the way I think about this. And that is directly the result. In 2015, I wrote an opinion for the New York Times. It's called Racism in the Laboratory. And I did this one with Daniel Colon Ramos, who is a full professor, a tenured distinguished professor, young scientist, you know, member of the National Academy of Sciences, originally from Puerto Rico, went to Harvard undergraduate and did his PhD at Harvard and postdoc at UCSF. And we connected. And my daughter one day said to me, my my oldest daughter, how come daddy, you have such a big voice and gravitas and veritas in the field, but you never talk about, you know, racism, uh, discrimination and things like that. And she inspired me to write that essay and that opinion. I recently spoke about it at the Howard Hughes with Ron Vail, who invited me to give a talk 
at the Howard Hughes and the Janela Center, and it made me reflect on that. I evolved over the years. When I was young and I was in medical school, I didn't have time to worry about those comments because I knew that I needed to concentrate on my studies, on my future, on the future of those around me. Because as Hugo told me, I wasn't just working for myself without knowing it. I was going to influence a generation that was after me. And I see now just directly in my laboratory, I train over 300 scientists and residents and doctors directly that I am responsible for them, plus many other lives that we have touched. So I didn't have time. My advice for those comments and those people dealing with that is it's not your problem, it's their problem. The way that I see it is, you know, we all have the capacity to change the world. Sometimes people may not agree with the way we look, with the way we talk, with the culture that we come from, and they may make comments that are painful. Um, don't ignore them. Le deal with them. Talk to someone. Find a mentor where you can bounce and say, how do I deal with this? They will tell you mostly what I will tell you. The way you deal with it is, um, you know, you got to do a good job in what you're doing. Be a good doctor. Be a good student. Be a good human being. Don't be vindictive. Don't be someone who thinks that retribution is a way to deal. You got to be giving and the world will give you so much more back. And that's the way I felt back then. And that's the way I continue to feel today. You know, it's not my problem, it's their problem. My role is to be a good surgeon, be a good scientist, be a good leader, you know, on behalf of what I do as a chair of neurosurgery, as a dean of research, as a president and founder of Mission Brain. Oh, that's such good advice. Okay, next question. Uh, how did you deal with imposter syndrome at UC Berkeley and Harvard, and how did you cope with the self-doubt? Thank you. You know, I gave my first talk about imposter syndrome two years ago, in 2022. Han Razak, who is a medical student at Harvard, one day out of nowhere asked me if I would be willing to come in and give a lecture about imposter syndrome. And before that, I had not thought about it. Uh, I mean, I reflected upon my own writings and my book. I reflected upon my own life. But same as the negative comments, I had had very little time to reflect in the way in which me not feeling, and I tell you even today, you know, I serve on the board of the Mayo Clinic and I sit there in a room and I still feel like I don't belong. Just right now, this morning, I was driving into this resort to give a lecture. I gave a keynote lecture in our work and everybody's waiting for me. There's a whole entourage of people outside of the auditorium waiting for me. And I felt so awkward about knowing, do I have anything intelligent to say, number one? Number two, this is such a fancy place. You know, a lot of very, very wealthy people in this resort, and I and, and I am not considered one of those people, to be honest with you. Look at the way I'm dressed, right? I have the handkerchief, I have a Mont Blanc pan and stuff like that, but I still, part of me is this is who I am in the outside to be able to feel like I need to fit. But the inside, I'm still the same little boy, the same undocumented migrant farm worker, nothing has changed. So I still feel that imposter syndrome. My advice to deal with that, same deal. Talk about it. Talk to your friends, talk to your mentors about it. You know, I wish, I got to tell you, my wife told me for the first time in 2010 that I needed to see a therapist because I needed to deal with imposter syndrome. I needed to deal with uh, my own insecurities. I needed to deal, why is it that I, I mean, this morning I was up at 5 a.m., Saturday, Sundays, I had my meetings. Last night I was meeting with my lab. I still work you know, like the same amount that I worked when I was a medical student or resident. It's because I'm dealing with my own insecurities. That's the only thing that I know how to do. You know, so my wife in 2010 says to me, you need to see a therapist. Two years ago when the when the show of Netflix got an Emmy and a BAFTA and I was like, yeah, whatever. My wife said, something is not right. You're not enjoying, I mean, this is an amazing accomplishment. You're a member of the academy and so on and so forth. You're a dean of research. You have four endowed professors. Nothing is enough for you. And she said, I, I told you 10 years ago, 13 years ago, you needed to see a therapist. I finally, you know, mastered the courage to go and speak to a psychologist who is a professional. And I asked those questions. 
I said, how do I deal with this? I don't feel right. I don't feel like I belong, you know, and don't be afraid of asking for help. That's my advice. So good. Okay, so next question. Where did the work ethic come from? How did you become such a hard worker? Well, I work hard and I'm working hard. <laughs> no, I got to tell you, this is the bottom line. I think two things. Number one, you got to have faith. You know that uh, whatever you do, somehow, somewhere, is going to lead to something. Something that is good. Something that is going to help someone. And it's almost like being able to imagine light when everybody else is darkness. So I don't see jobs. I don't see work. Even when I was working in the fields and I look back because actually Ugo helped me write this essay. When I was a tomato picker, I didn't see my job as just picking tomatoes. I Every time I got into that tractor and at the time I, I started picking tomatoes with my hands, I moved to a tractor and then eventually I was driving the tomato picker. These are the evolution. You know, it takes a lot of years to get to that. And I, I got there very fast, all right? So, <laughs> uh, you know, Asuncion, who was my co-worker, he always teased me because it took me 11 years to be a tomato driver, the big machines. And I was there for seven months and I was already driving because I was driven. I loved it. When I was a tomato picker, I didn't just pick tomatoes. I wanted to be I wanted to pick the best tomatoes. I enjoy seeing the colors. When I was driving the tractors, I just didn't just drove the tractor. I was looking back and I wanted my loads to be perfect. I wanted perfection. I wanted beauty. I was I saw myself as an artist. I saw myself as a as a, as a, as someone who saw beyond. And when I was picking and driving the, the tomato picker, which is quite dangerous, by the way, I have a crew and people lose their hands and toes and fingers and you name it and die and, and they can die. I mean, these are very dangerous machines. I saw myself as a leader who was responsible for human lives. And people said, well, aren't you happy now that you're a brain surgeon? I said, no, I was happy when I was a tomato picker. Happiness is not education. Happiness is not money. Happiness is not titles and things. Happiness comes from being able to help people, in my opinion. So the hard work, I don't see it as work. I see it as opportunities. I see it as a blessing to be able to do what I do. I see it as a gift and as a privilege. So yes, I want to do it. I want to do it because I feel like I'm being gifted every single day that I'm receiving gifts. And I do, by the way, a lot of the stuff. I mean, yesterday I got a, I didn't work today because I was embarrassed a little bit, but I love handkerchiefs, you know, because when I work in the field, they were cotton. And of course, mine are now silk and they're very fancy. Just yesterday I got one from one of my students that his mom sent to me, handmade somewhere in the world and, and stuff like that. But uh, nothing has changed. You know what I mean? My kids, Teased me because they said, I said, but God, this is a handkerchief for a farm worker. I said, Daddy, these are made of silk. I said, well, they absorb water better. <laughs> yeah, and I could just say that, you know, Dr. Uh, Hugh has been working hard, you know, from a very early age in the fields. And, uh, and now he's a neurosurgeon. He works hard that way, too. So um, thank you. Diff thank different you, kind of hard work. Different car, but it's a blessing, obviously, just to be able to do it every single day. We have another question. Um, Dr. Q, how does your work-life balance look like these days? Oh, I could answer that one. He has an amazing wife. Let's not forget that. But <laughs> That is true. I was going to say with my <laughs> wife. So Anna and Hugo knows, I mean, it's like, it's amazing, actually. By the way, Julian, come back on uh, on the screen because I want to do a picture with the four of us because I want to show Anna that I was here with Ugo. She's going to be happy to see that. Smile, Ugo. There you go. There you go. Perfect. I took a few. I sent them to you. But I, I was going to say that uh, is, is the family. So this is this is um, several important decisions in life that you make, but probably one that, that sometimes, you know, may be the most crucial is who your partner is. You know, and in my case, I have an amazing partner, someone who's patient. What did I say? She told me that I needed to see a therapist back in 2010. 
And I didn't believe her. And it was another 10 years, 11 years later that I realized that I needed to touch someone because patients were leaving me with the scars and they were never recovering. I felt that, well, my pain is not as big as the pain that my patients have when they battle cancer. But I realized, I didn't realize that every patient was leaving me with a little scar and they accumulate. So who you do that, uh, who is your partner, it becomes very, very crucial. The second one is, in my opinion, uh, the, the life balance. I wish I can tell you that I have a great work-life balance, all right? Because um, once again, one can argue you work very hard. I can argue I love what I do. The reality is that it does get a little bit stressful. I would say that the last two or three years since I started thinking about a therapist, saw a therapist, I've been able to enjoy myself more, all right? Why? Simply because in the morning, you know, I wake up and I just, I see the world a little bit different. I made myself a cup of coffee. I play with the dogs. You know, I did work in the morning and then before coming to the lectures, I did a little workout. And instead of just working out with no purpose, I let the dogs out and I roll around on the floor and I play with them. And it's just a different way of seeing the world. And I think that I am getting, I'm not there yet, achieving that balance a little bit better. How is that? Is that a, is that a fair answer? <laughs> no, but he he does have an amazing wife and an amazing team. Then that yes, I think that's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, another question: uh, Do you have any advice on how to find a mentor? Because you talked about mentors a lot during the presentation. Yes. Well, I think you have Hugo right here. He's working at Berkeley. I mean, and and that uh, he's doing amazing work. Our institutions have. Um, I remember when I first. You know, and I don't know if, uh, if, if if Hugo stole the story, but it's in my book. So it was very simple. I decided that I wanted to work in a lab. I didn't know how. And people, and I didn't know how to get in. And I started looking for answers. At the time, there was no internet. Uh, email was coming out. So you just start making phone calls. And someone said, well, there's it's a program for research in, uh, in UC Davis. There's a program for research at Stanford, and there's a there's a name of a person, Hugo Mora Torres, and then uh, contact him and and see what uh, what they may have available. Not really knowing that he was already part of a NIH funded program that was giving support to students just like myself who needed to be in the STEM and potentially work in the lab. And that's how my really. So don't be afraid of asking. Don't go. And by the way, I learned from Hugo that your mentors don't have to look like you. I mean, if you look back, my mentor. And 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 I uh, used to Berkeley was Hugo and Joe Martinez. By the time I went to Harvard, it was Dave Potter and Ned Kravitz. You know, uh, they couldn't be di themselves different. Dave Potter came from a long generation of Harvard student graduates. Uh, you know, extraordinarily wealthy family, but yet very given. You know, Ed, Ed Kravitz. By the way, I'm going to go to his 94th birthday in in May in Boston. He is still the the, the most senior NIS funded investigator. He was from a Jewish family in the Bronx where Jewish were not even accepted in schools. So he understood, you know, the trials and tribulations of being, you know, underrepresented or being discriminated against. You know, they couldn't be more different. But he, I remember when my wife and I got married, he organized a little wedding. It was part Jewish, part, part Christian, a combination of both. And it just, you learn from people, you know, once again, they don't have to look like you, but you have to be able to open. You have to have a little bit of emotional IQ to, to once again talk to people, to ask questions, you know what I mean? And, and also search the questions yourself, you know what I mean? And be able to not be afraid of failure. That's another thing. And you see, when you see, when you do that, people are attracted to you. If you see, I mean, people tease me about my Q team because I have a team called the Q team. It's for quality, quality team. You know, and they are running all over the place. They are, I have members right now, Adrian, from how many countries? Four countries right now, my team directly, right? And then you saw the picture, another 10 countries probably for the lab. But they are amazing, you know, the number of people that surround, you know, me because I want to learn from them, simply. You know what I mean? So when you do that, you know, you just uh, end up having a great time. All right, next All right. question. Do you want to ask it, Jubin? Uh, no, no, go ahead. It's the last question. Um, 
because uh, uh, he's Dr. Q only is going to be there till 12 and we're keeping him over and his uh, assistants are going to track me down and haunt me. So this is the last question. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of great questions, but it's just, we just can't keep Dr. You know, if we keep Dr. Q here longer then his assistants are going to come looking for me. Well, my, my <laughs> patient, most likely my team. So, <laughs> All right. Last question. How did you overcome the economic challenges in your journey? Beautiful question. I, I believe that education is a um, combination of you investing on yourself and others investing on you. And there, there are different forms of investment. You know, there is emotional investment, time investment, economic investment. So I always felt that I wanted, I never felt that people owed me anything or that I owed anybody anything. I wanted to get an education and if I needed to pay for part of it, I was going to do it with gusto, with pleasure. If I could get a scholarship, I was going to do that. I was investing on myself. I saw myself as investing on my future. So I ended up, you know, when I was at UC Berkeley, I worked. And Ugo knows I was a physics tutor, a chemistry tutor, a biology tutor. And actually, most people don't realize at that time, I was I had an amazing life because I was getting paid very good money to teach things that I enjoy teaching, actually. And then when I went to Harvard, I ended up getting working in a lab also. And that was an amazing experience that allowed me to get accepted into the MD PhD program, get more scholarships, get scholarships from other institutions. You know, and but I still got loans. So by the time I finish between undergraduate, medical school, and residency, I had a debt of about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. All right, at the time, this is two thousand and five. It's a lot of money, but I was never afraid. I knew, you know, unless of course God didn't bless me with health, I was going to live you know, with potentially someone with a debt. But I sorted out in such a way that that debt was not transferable. I was going to leave the country with a debt. But I felt that if God blessed me with health, with health I was going to pay. By 2010, I finished paying all my debt. I remember there was an article written in the uh, in Reader's Digest. And the guy came in. The show Hopkins had been released already. Got a peep out of it. It was the first and last episode. I opened the show and closed the show. And the guy said, you know, for as famous as this guy is, he has no furniture in his house. He just didn't know that we had barely enough money to pay my debt. And I wanted to pay the house just in case. And the house was empty because the kids were little and they loved the space to run around, David, Olivia, and Gabriela. So I, I think about it that way. But I, I do believe that, uh, to me anyways, I felt that I needed to invest in myself. That's how I did it. You know, and I'm not afraid to recognize. I hear a lot of talk. People want education for free. I'm always afraid. Anybody who tells you they're giving you something for free, there's something in return they're getting from you. And sometimes we don't even realize it. And societies that tend to give education completely for free, they also tend to have issues with high level education and stuff like that. I look back at my own country in Mexico. Education is supposed to be for free. Unfortunately, you know, we do have a bifurcation of classes that even that is even more accentuated in our own bifurcation of classes in the United States. So that's how I did it. Yeah, and he's never starved, and he's always been able to have a roof over his head. And uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest fear is that, you know, I mean, we had the AMA president a few weeks ago, and he said he only know he doesn't know any doctor that's out of work. They, the ones that you know are out of work, they choose to be out of work. So, um, <laughs> but yeah. But Dr. Q, I'm not going to hold you any longer. Thank you again for making time for us. Uh, always inspired to have you. And and uh, thank you again for for everything that you do. So. Well, thank you, Hugo. Thank you. So great to see you on the screen right here. And it's you better half say, here too. Yeah. Do you want? Do you get? You want to say a few words? So we just do to everybody hear your voice. Yeah. I mean, I just you know, please. Um, everything that you mentioned, I res. You know, is this? I, I practice. I practice everything that you mentioned. Uh, I love working with my students. It's a gift that keeps giving. Uh, every student that I work with, I, I, I expect great things from them. 
Mm -hmm. And most of the most of the time it happens, even though those that don't go off to medical school end up doing great things in their lives. Right. I just have a, uh, an immense, immense optimism for humanity. I see the good in all of them. All I can do is encourage them, just like all you can do is do the best job with your patients. And then and, and the health will, 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 will take care of itself. So I'm so, so proud of you. Um, Thank you. You know, when we first met, I knew I expected. A lot of great things for you, but none of us thought it would happen this well. And I'm <laughs> glad you don't, you don't forget what you came from. I, I ran into Thank a group you. of the Prehealth Dreamers uh, at a conference recently. Yes. And that you were very supportive of them. And, and they appreciate that. And so anyways, I'm so happy. I hope to connect with you uh, in, a, in person in a few years and, and catch yes. up with Annie and the, and the children. Anyways, yes. take care, my friend. Thank appreciate you, Hugo. You. I I remember, I'll leave you with that one last story. With this is how special Hugo is. First of all, he just connected with one of his students, you know, and we're communicating. Second, I remember when we met in 1993 in the summer at UC Berkeley. And I remember after I connected with him, I called him and he came to visit. And he goes, you have a resume later ready for me and your transcripts. And then it's a resume. I had no idea what a resume is. Actually, I just helped my daughter put her resume together. And I remember at the time there were no computers. So I'm going to the computer center and I'm like typing and I figure out, read something. And I put my resume together, brought my transcripts. And we met at a place called Cafe Strata in Berkeley, right? And this is famous because it's also Anthony Quinn made the movie La Strata, who got an Academy Award. And Anthony Quinn's real name was Oh, uh, he got disconnected. Oh, I don't know what happened. I, I think he was referring to the story where, um, you know, I, I looked at his resume and I and I looked at and we talked. And I go, you know what, Alfredo, with what you have going on here, you 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 have a good chance of getting to Harvard. And he started laughing, laughing, and laughing. And he goes, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, man. I'm happy. I'm I'd be forced to graduate. And and I think that's what he was referring to the story where we where we where I first saw greatness and 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 him and and his perseverance and all, all those all those uh, um competencies that the American medical schools are now looking at as uh competencies that that can contribute to be somebody being a good doctor he had them all. So Hugo, so now that you're um. Some of the questions people are asking, you think they would be like, you know, some people feel like, oh, they're 36. Are they too old to apply to medical school? What do you say to those people? The medical schools don't look at age. They look at your at your uh, readiness, your preparedness, what you've invested into uh, being prepared to be a doctor. Um, yeah. So I've had students who were mid-30s get into medical school. Uh, the, 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 the challenge at that age is that is is your is your perseverance your financial resources uh that's a challenge not your abilities uh so yeah so yeah is the medical schools don't look at your age they look at your readiness so what about people that are non-traditional what advice would you give to them that's your superpower <laughs> seriously uh know yourself love yourself uh appreciate it and use that as your superpower uh, and if you need help, uh, uh, try to find a good advisor who understands holistic review, uh, the way the medical schools are practicing it. Uh, so first of all, when you meet with an advisor, ask, uh, are you familiar with holistic review that the American Association of Medical Colleges is practicing? If they say, oh, yeah, that's somebody you work with. If they say, huh, what? That means they haven't tra been trained and they're not current with the most recent admissions practices. Um. Yeah, and I think I think that was some of the questions people are asking. Um, how do you find research? And so a lot of people are asking about how do you find research? And I was just gonna say, um, we've had like a lot of talks about research, summer programs. We had the NIH director for intramural, you know, person that oversees, she's actually spoken to us two or three times already. And so we have a lot of those and go back and look at those. Um, those are either not like 30 second things that we could tell you, but she actually goes through the whole thing of how to approach um, labs and things. Um, so yeah. what I, I do want to add to that is that if you want to be a doctor and you don't have research opportunities, don't try it. 
you know, you don't need it to get into medical school. You need patient care experience, first and foremost. You need to know your why. Why you why medicine? And it, it can't be your why from when you were a child, when you were younger. That could, that's I call it the catalytic moment. That's what got you going on this journey. And every experience since then has built has has built a stronger, stronger chemical reaction to the point where you're not where you're unstoppable. So if you can get research, great. If you if you can't and you don't have the opportunity the time, move forward. Don't let it don't let it hinder you. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to be a PhD, yes, you're going to need research. But if you just want to be, uh, if you if you want to be pure and simple, a doctor, clinician, PA, NP, DO, MD, uh, you want to be a clinician of some sort, if you want to help community and work in community medicine, then get experience in community medicine. Let that be your superpower, and 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 know that that's going to be sufficient for the medical schools. It, it will be. Yeah, and, and I think like we've done a lot of stuff also for summer programs as well that they pay you to actually go. And believe it or not, a lot of them, people say we don't get enough applications. So, uh, I mean, this is free money. Um, um, you know, there's free money available to you. Um, um, you know, free money to you to, to apply and, and go and spend the summer. I make like eight grand for the for two months, which that's a pretty good. I mean, you're not gonna make money as you would working in tech, but it's pretty comfortable, you know. Um, yeah. Um, so we don't want to hold anybody else any longer. Um, and I think what happened with Doctor Q, he was at a conference, and I think the Wi-Fi. I think he just texted me and he said there was a problem with the Wi-Fi. So we're not gonna hold everybody longer, and. Uh, some people are asking if Hugo can come back and do a talk, and yes, we'll have him um, come back. Oh, this is actually a question you could actually answer. Um, people are saying, you know, I'm thinking about transferring uh, to either UC Davis or UC Berkeley. Why should you choose one versus the other? Um, first of all, wherever you get in is the best place for you to be. If you have a choice, then look at where you're going to be most comfortable uh, living and, 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 and getting an education. One is UC Davis is in a quarter system. UC Berkeley is in a semester system. Uh, they start at different times. Um, they have different, uh, it's, it's a little bit more affordable work at, to live at UC Davis than, than at Berkeley, but they're comparable. If you want to, if your goal is to transfer to a UC and then from there to medical, you know, apply to medical school, they're comparable. Um, UC Davis just put on an amazing UC Davis pre-health conference that Jubin have started, helped started many years ago, and it's still alive and well. But you can go to, if you go to Berkeley, you can attend that conference anyways. Um, so there's pros and cons. There's no, basically what I like, to, I say do a cost benefit analysis. Which one's gonna help me the best? And which ones do I have to invest the most, the most in to get my education? So think with, that way you think uh, more objectively as opposed to subjectively like saying, oh, Berkeley has the, you know, the, the tower behind me. It's got a better architecture. No, nah, that doesn't matter. It's where you're, wherever you're going to be happiest in. And, and if you're happy there, you're going to be a better student. Yeah. And I think that's one of the big things that Hugo touched on is like, if you've never lived in a city environment and you don't know about it and, you know, there's, there's some definitely learning, uh, curve there just to be in a urban city uh versus you know um berkeley davis who's a suburbia and as if you've lived in suburbia um but yeah i mean those are all i mean those are all great 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 places and i think like it's kind of like saying you know do you want to drive a lamborghini or a ferrari you know it's uh, uh i think this is a, they're both great institutions um you know oh. and it's or a Honda or, or a Toyota, in my case. <laughs> Honda or Toyota, true, 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 true. But anyways, I'm gonna let you everybody go. Um, it, you know, it's uh, uh, oh, this is another one that's come up. People wanting to know um, should what they should major in as pre meds. Whatever sub topic you like. The, 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 the difference is if you're a science major, it's going to be probably a little bit easier for you to get the science courses. Uh, if you're a community college transfer student, get as many prereqs as you can before you transfer into a four-year university. 
medical schools are perfectly happy with you getting your general biology, your general chemistry, your organic chemistry, your physics at a community college, and then moving to a, to a four-year university to finish your upper divisions. Um, but really, uh, the major uh, doesn't matter. Uh, find a major that you like because then uh, upper division courses is where you'll be really getting into the meat of your major, you know, the, 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 the main courses. Um, if you choose psychology or something that's not science, uh, more than likely, you're going to have to do some post-baccalaureate courses, which is fine, but just plan, plan on a longer uh, gap year experience. There's pros and cons to both, but uh, the, pro, the pros for being a, a science major, a bio major, is that it's easier to, to get those courses, uh, to get that organic chemistry, to get that microbiology, to get that biochemistry than if you were not a, a science major. Um, but people who are non-science majors actually tend to score higher in the car section of the MCAT, critical analysis and reasoning section. People that are um, bio majors obviously tend to score better in the in the in the in the sciences section of the MCAT. So there's pros and cons to both.